The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion number 253 in the name of James Dornan on a living wage in Scottish football. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members who wish to participate in the debate please press the request to speak buttons now. I call on James Dornan to open the debate. Around seven minutes, please, Mr Dornan. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to start off by thanking Wally Smith and Scott Robertson, who have been fighting for fairness for our young football pl players for many years. Without their tenacity and determination to do the right thing, we would not be having this debate today. President Officer, Scottish football employs thousands of people across the industry. The scale of football is no longer 22 men in a pitch with a referee in the middle. Football runs on a commercial basis now. Stadiums no longer only host events on a Saturday afternoon, but are a constant venue for conferences, parties, charity events, concerts and training days. Footballing organisations employ cleaners, cooks, administrative staff, and even a humble pie takes an employed person to reach the hands of supporters. And match day staffs can work long, taxing and physical hours, running from one end of the ground to another. Yet many of these people will be on less than the living wage. Football is one of the most if not the most influential sports in the world. Millions of people are engaged with the sport around the globe. The 2014 World Cup reached an audience of 3.2 billion people. The final alone saw 695 million watch it live, which is approximately 15% of the world's population. That is some figure. This is the reach of the beautiful game. We're all aware of the benefits sports have in health and communities. Now, we don't have used to be, but we now are. Football is now more than a sport which is focused on the big teams and players. It's a vital community engagement tool. The sport is breaking down barriers to bring people together. And football also provides those multiple health benefits, both physically and mentally. It supports good mental health through increased confidence and sense of belonging, a sense of team spirit, and as a tool to reduce stress. The physical benefits are just as impressive, with recent research suggesting that football may be better for you than going for a run or lifting weights. That's good, because I was rubbish at both of those things. The physical health benefits of football can also be seen in a reduction in the risk of heart disease, a lowering of cholesterol, and a way to challenge obesity. I had the pleasure to attend the University of Glasgow's Institute of Health and Wellbeing, the Scottish Professional League Trust event in Parliament on Tuesday night, which highlighted the good work being carried out in these areas by many of Scotland's football clubs clear evidence that the social impact of the game is no longer just reaching men, but also older people, women and children. Given its power and given its dependency and support from all members of society, but traditionally those from working class areas, football has a responsibility to ensure it is doing the right thing by those that it employs, even if just to set a good example to others. For years, it's been understood that football has a massive impact on poverty. A recent forum, which was attended by senior figures from UNICEF, professional footballers and sporting advisors, concluded that the resounding message was that sport does indeed have the ability to affect positive change and promote international development. Of course, it should not be seen as a silver bullet to the problems of poverty and disadvantage. The power of sport to affect change is as a tool within a broader toolkit. The report found while sport has a profound effect on community with health, education and morale, that clubs shouldn't ignore their own responsibilities. And it's here that I must congratulate Hearts Football Club, and particularly their forward-thinking Chief Executive and Chair, Anne Budge, on being the first club in the UK to be an accredited living wage employer. For a club that's had its own financial difficulties in recent years, this is a remarkable achievement. But it just highlights, A, that it can be done, and B, the benefits that accrue from doing it. And what better way to impact on poverty than to pay people a living wage? I know there are some clubs that pay their, their own staff the living wage but are not accredited because of contracts elsewhere. But unfortunately, not all clubs are following the example of Hearts, and the disparity could not be starker than between the two biggest Glasgow clubs. Rangers, another club with massive financial difficulties in recent season, have made huge steps to becoming accredited. The only thing stopping them are some historic contracts with outside suppliers of services. The team I support, on the other hand, have made it quite clear that they do not support the living wage. And let me make it clear, the board of the team I support, on the other hand, have made it clear that they do not support the living wage. Most of the fans that I spoke to certainly do. I believe one of the reasons they, they gave was it would have a knock-on effect on other wages. Well, if Hearts and Rangers can afford to do this with their financial issues, I can see no reason why the biggest and richest club in Scotland are unable to do so. Many of us grew up with tales of how Celtic started to help those that needed assistance. Maybe the board should get to know their history and reconsider their position. I'm aware of thousands of Celtic fans who would agree with me in this matter, if not always on other things. 
I'm also aware that Unite, the Union Youth Committee, wrote to Celtic just today to ask them a number of questions around their use of zero hours contracts, as well as their commitment or lack of to the living wage, and I look forward to seeing their response. Scottish Football Association staff are paid over a minimum wage at roughly £10 per hour across the board, and this too is a strive towards positive change. Indeed, after speaking to representatives across players' unions, it's now recognised that some young players are being paid less than even the minimum wage. I spoke earlier about the work Wally and Scott had been doing to protect young players, and there are a number of issues around the length of journeys young boys have to make, very often to get 15 minutes of game time if they're lucky. But maybe even worse than that, is that there have been reports of top flight clubs paying young players on contracts of a pound a week. Of course, it's any young boy's dream to play football, but that dream shouldn't be manipulated by clubs to allow a failure to meet legal and moral commitments. Clubs are also involved in the modern apprenticeship programme. The Scottish Government defines an apprenticeship as a tool to provide an opportunity to earn a wage while learning skills and achieving an industry-recognised qualification. In other words, tools for life. That is employability, sustainability and a means to live. Speak to the Scottish PFA and they are concerned that some young men are not being paid the amount they are due at apprenticeship level. But more than that, when they, they don't make a career from the game, as most of them won't, they are often left without a skill set and tragically this has led on occasions to them eventually suffering with acute mental health issues. Devastatingly, there was a report of one young lad who took his own life after being released from his club. Now, I'm not saying for a second that clubs can be nursemaids, but they do have a duty to, of care to these young kids and they must fulfil it. And I would suggest one of the ways that they do that is by educating and making sure that they're ready for the outside world when they leave the game. Signed officer, there's no denying that football reaches into the lives of people across Scotland in a way that most other things can't, including politics. And it's my firm belief that while this parliament aims to increase the number of accredited living wage employers, organisations which already have a huge impact on Scottish life should be leading the way. That's why I encourage this parliament and I urge all football clubs to set that good example, do the right thing and pay the living wage. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Dornan. I now call Douglas Ross to be followed by Richard Leonard. Around four minutes, please, Mr Ross. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And could I start by referring members to my declaration of members' interests, as I am a football referee with the Scottish Football Association. Uh, and can I also say that I was uh, selected to speak in this debate by my chief whip at the beginning of the week before my appointment for Saturday came out. So I won't enter into some of the conversations that Mr Dornan had about the two biggest teams in Glasgow uh, because of my role that I'll be taking there at 12 o'clock uh, on Saturday afternoon. Uh, I did agree with an awful lot of what Mr Dornan had to say in his remarks, particularly the earlier points in his remarks. And I was interested to hear that involvement in football can be better for you than running or lifting weights. Well, with my own involvement in football, I've got to run, lift weights just to be involved in football. So uh, sometimes you can combine all three. And I understand and I realise that uh, members' business is normally a consensual uh, area that we can discuss, but I would like to make one point, because while much of what Mr Dornan said today in his speech had uh, a great deal of substance, which I can agree with, what I couldn't agree with was comments he made over the summer, uh, indeed just last month, when he made a similar call, which he's making today for the Scottish Professional Football League uh, to pay the living wage, when he also said that Scottish athletics should pay the living wage. Now, he put out a press release. Two days later, he wrote to Scottish Athletics only to find out, only to find out that they actually pay the living wage. And I know a number of people within Scottish Athletics that were disappointed that he hadn't gone to them first to seek their clarification. And indeed, he tarnished their name with some uh, because of the comments that he put out in the press, which were factually inaccurate. But I will give way to Mr Dornan on that James point. Dornan. Yes, the letter, sent, this, the letter was sent to Scottish Athletics before the press release was sent out. I accept he may well not have received it. However, the, the issue was that they were not an accredited a living wage employer. They accepted that after discussions that that was a, something that they should be doing so that they could set that example for other people and I believe that's going to be the outcome of it. This was not about attacking Scottish athletics. What we did was we highlighted a lot of good work they've done and I think that this has allowed them to highlight that even more. 
I will give you some extra time, Mr Ross, for your courtesy. Thank you very Douglas much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, while they may not have been accredited as living wage employers, they were living wage employers, however, and I think that point was lost in translation with some, and I think it's important to get that clarification on the record here today. Uh, as I said, I, I won't be getting too involved in the club aspects, but I would uh, put on record, uh, I think, the good work done by Hearts of Midlothian since October 2014, when they became living wage employers and accredited to that. And in Indeed, I think we can be encouraging clubs and indeed all employers. It's a target of this government and indeed I think this parliament that we increase the number of living wage uh, employers throughout Scotland and indeed the United Kingdom. But I do have some sympathy for the Scottish Professional Football League. They do feel that they are being victimised in this area. They are the only operation which is being asked to give this unanimous approval. Why are they being singled out? And I'll quote from Neil Con Doncaster, the SPFL chief executive, when he said, why is football the target of focus here and not any other individual sector? Our clubs and their staff carry out huge amounts of positive work in their communities and through charitable initiatives of which the SPFL is very proud. And we feel these activities are richly deserving of attention and focus. And I agree with them. So I think we have to be very careful that we don't victimise and we don't pillarise the Scottish Professional Football League when work can be done and we can encourage, and I think there's cross-party consensus that we can encourage people to move forward in that way, but we shouldn't single out, as you said, a, a great sport that's enjoyed by so many in this country for some of the criticism and some of the demands that we have here today when we are not willing to do it for every other sector uh, around the country. Um, in my remaining time, Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm grateful to Mr Dornan for taking this forward. Uh, I know he's written to a number of clubs. I believe there is a, a will to move forward with this. Every club in Scotland, I understand, pays the minimum wage and some are moving towards the living wage. We would like everyone uh, across Scotland to be able to provide the wages to ensure their staff can uh, live comfortably uh, but also do the work that they enjoy. But there is work to be done, there's more we can do. Uh, I'm pleased to take part in this debate today, but I am slightly concerned that some of the comments could be seen as attacking one sector when we don't look at the breadth of issues that we've got to face in Scottish society. Thank you. Richard Leonard to be followed by Ruth Maguire. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, can I thank James Dornan as well for bringing this important matter uh, to the floor of this Parliament and can I say that for my part I do wish to associate myself with all of his comments uh, in his opening speech. Can I also take this opportunity to pay tribute to the magnificent work of the Poverty Alliance in both campaigning for a living wage and for all the hard work they do in promoting the living wage and in diligently accrediting private businesses, public bodies, third sector organisations who apply to become uh, living wage employers in Scotland. Deputy Presiding Officer, in recent days I have asked the Minister for Employability uh, and Training in Committee uh, and the Cabinet Secretary for Economy, Jobs and Fair Work in this chamber if they would consider whether a target of just 1,000 accredited living wage employers in Scotland by this time next year was ambitious enough. Uh, let me make the point that this is not a council of despair. Far from it. It is a rallying cry of hope with over 360,000 private enterprises in Scotland alone, I think 1,000 employees is far too timid a target. And I make this argument uh, not in order to stretch the targets required of the Poverty Alliance with their existing resources. Uh, I make it gently in order to set more ambitious targets of the Poverty Alliance, but with substantially increased resources. Yes, of course. Jamie Hepburn. Of course, in commenting on the resource that the uh, Poverty Alliance has, I'm sure he would want to reflect on the fact that the Scottish Government provides resource to the Poverty Alliance to help promote the living wage. He is right, of course, to remark that this is a, a matter he has uh, raised uh, on two occasions, well, three occasions now this week, but hopefully he would reflect, given where we uh, started off, this is a fairly early uh, process. I think setting a target of 1,000 accredited employ employers in such a short space of time is surely uh, an ambitious target, but of course it's uh, one we can hopefully exceed. Richard Leonard. Um, yeah, as I said at the committee, I think our definitions of ambitious uh, probably are at variance. Um, let me make it clear uh, too though that in the broader sense this question before us is not simply about the individual standard of living of these working people employed by Scotland's top football clubs. Uh, it is not even simply about their individual standard of well-being. It is at its very root about the kind of society we want to live in. 
So it's not just a material question, it's an ethical question too. Because in these our top football clubs, especially the lowest paid workers, not only endure the lowest hourly rate of pay, but because they are for the most part on part-time hours, they have the lowest weekly rate of pay too. And because they are often seasonal workers, they have the lowest annual wage as well. Uh, which reminds me of something that Tom Mann, the socialist pioneer and trade union agitator, uh, said in response to the moralising of Thomas Carlyle to the working class. Uh, Tom Mann said to Carlyle, he said that the corollary of the biblical commandment, thou shalt not steal, is thou shalt not be stolen from. Uh, and these workers in our top football clubs are being stolen from. This is not just an injustice, it is daylight and sometimes floodlight robbery, and we need to bring it to an end. And can I say to those clubs and their supporters, this isn't just about in-work poverty, it is about in-retirement poverty too, because large inequality in wages at work amplify, amplify into massive inequalities in household resources in retirement too. Finally, Deputy Presiding Officer, it is worth recalling that when Jimmy Maxton, John Wheatley, Jenny Lee and the Independent Labour Party first championed the living wage in the 1920s, it sprang first and foremost from the harsh daily realities of working class experience. But it did also have a theoretical underpinning based on the economist J.A. Hobson's analysis that economic depression and mass unemployment were themselves a direct result of inequality underconsumption and abject poverty on the one hand with conspicuous consumption and wealth enough to export capital on the other. Now I don't begrudge our top footballers high rewards in their often short playing careers but if ever there was a case of conspicuous consumption in the midst of abject poverty it is at our top football clubs. So let's support this motion this afternoon and join together with the trades unions, supporters groups and the Poverty Alliance itself to step up the pressure on all our football clubs to pay the living wage in the season ahead. Ruth Maguire to be followed by John Finney. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I congratulate my colleague James Dornan for securing this debate on the living wage in Scottish football. The social case for the living wage is clear. It's simply unacceptable that working people find themselves in a situation where they have to turn to food banks or unsustainable debt just to get by. Ensuring that everyone has a decent income for the work they do and can access the goods and services that most of us would deem necessary to live on and participate in society is something that I'm sure everyone in the chamber can get behind and support. I perhaps should have started by putting on record that my interest in this debate is not only around the very important Fair Work agenda, but also as a Heart of Midlothian season ticket holder and Foundation of Hearts member. Hearts were indeed the first club in Scotland and in the UK to introduce the living wage. As a fan, I'm proud of how my club has conducted itself in this matter and the investment they've made in their staff and also in uh, working with the Foundation of Hearts to make fan ownership a reality. I'm grateful to James for acknowledging their good work in his speech and to other members, even if the original motion didn't quite capture it. <laughs> Within a football club, eh, many of the staff that will benefit from the living wage will be involved in match day hospitality. In North Ayrshire, where my own constituency is, around 3,500 people are employed in hospitality. It's an industry where, unfortunately, there are still far too many people struggling with low pay and a lack of regular hours. During my time as a North Ayrshire councillor, I chaired an inquiry into non-standard lending and heard evidence from individuals employed in hospitality of just how tough it was surviving week to week on a minimum wage with no set hours. So the social case for fair work and the living wage is well rehearsed, however there's also an important business case to be made. Independently conducted research on employers who've introduced the living wage have shown increases in productivity as a result of living wage employees contributing a higher level of effort and an openness to changing job roles within the organisation. That, of course, brings businesses cost-saving opportunities from increasing staff retention and reducing sickness absence. And the value of improved levels of morale, motivation and commitment from staff right across the pay distribution 
can have a hugely um, positive effect on the success of a business. One other thing I'd like to mention today, though, is that as more and more people choose to consume fair tra trade products and look to spend their hard-earned cash with ethical businesses, it can also provide a real competitive edge. Hearts showed real leadership and Chair Anne Budge is quoted as saying that they were simply doing the right thing. They sent a very clear signal to other clubs, to the club's employees, customers and the supply chain. Ambitions for growth are not incompatible with acting to create a fairer society. And the action that Hearts have taken benefits not just the club and the immediate community, but wider society. I commend Anne Budge and Hearts on doing the right thing and urge others to follow suit. Thank you. Uh, can I have Mr John Finney, please, in the last of the open debates? Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, I congratulate uh, James Dornan on his motion. And like the previous speaker, Ruth Maguire, um, declare that I'm a heart of an the season ticket holder, a member of the uh, Foundation of Hearts, and occasionally sit beside her when we both get to the game. Um, I'm also a living wage, accredited living wage employer, as I know a number of my colleagues are, and I think there's an important role, and it's to, to pick up the point that my colleague Douglas Ross made. There's a promotional role for all, for all of us connected with that, and certainly my wish to promote it isn't exclusively with football or any other. I, I think there's an obligation for us to, to promote it everywhere possible, because it's a damning indictment in all of us that the levels of inequality that exist in this very rich society, and what we do know that in work poverty is a significant part of that. Now, my own party talks a lot about pay issues, and there's an example that's been alluded to by previous speakers, the disparity between uh, the um, incomes of people within the same, effectively the same organisation. And we know that that income inequality, uh, at the time that the decision was taken by Hearts, uh, was that top 10% had 15% more wealth than the bottom 40% combined. That's a damning indictment, and it was an increase from the previous year. Now, the world's full of statistics. At the bottom uh, line of them all of us, they quite often relate to individuals. The press release that accompanied Hart's announcement had the Peter Kelly, director of the Poverty Alliance, talking about it being an important step in the campaign to end poverty pay. And at that time, almost two in three children in Scotland live in a household where someone in poverty lived in a household where someone worked. And the living wage was a vital tool in lifting people out of poverty. And importantly, uh, Mr. Kelly said football clubs had an important role in our communities across Scotland. And that's been alluded to. They're very, very important part. Now, another declaration I'd like to make is that I'm a member of uh, Oxfam and I had the privilege of being at a, a meeting last night in the Parliament where Oxfam released their decent work for Scotland's low paid workers, a job to be done report. This was work commissioned by the University of Oxfam involving the, the University of the West of Scotland and the Warwick Institute for Employment Research. Um, the Cabinet Secretary, M Mr Brown, attended last night and, and was very well received for the positive response he gave to this report. And I know that there are a number of recommendations made to not only the Scottish Government but also employees. Significantly, this, this project, which included um, street sampling, it included surveys and it included um, a some other method which escapes me at the moment, but involved 15 people, 1,500 people across Scotland. And there's, there's various tables uh, published about what the priority was, and it won't surprise anyone that the priorities for decent work identified by focus group participants was a decent hourly rate. And it goes on to say an hourly rate or salary that is enough to cover basic needs such as food, housing, and things most people take for granted without going into debt. Now, Oxfam's been involved in a lot of creative work, uh, and particularly around the Human Kind Index. And that research has shown that people's aspirations are fairly modest. People just want enough. Well, in, in an industry like football, where there are obscene sums of money changing, I don't think it's too much to ask. I got a pie at the last game I was at, and the, the, I was delighted. Um, some people may think me more than one pie. Um, delighted that the, the, the young woman who served me said, and enjoy the game after. Well, I enjoyed the fact that that person was properly remunerated, and as has been alluded to, it's good for business too. And indeed, um, the, uh, 
Living Wage Foundation, they, they quote in their literature um, someone who says, introducing the living wage is not only the right thing to do for our co-workers, it also makes good business sense. This is a long-term investment in our people based on values and our belief that a team with a good compensation and working conditions is in a position to provide a great experience to our customers. Now, I'm not promoting any, that's a large uh, Scandinavian um, furniture company. Um, I want people to do things because they're, they, they, they're, they're the right thing to do and because they, they make sense. And I like that in the press release that Hart of Merlothian said, they said the club feels that implementing the living wage is entirely in keeping with the values that we hold dear as Edinburgh's oldest football club. That is a sense of community and a sense of social justice. I commend the, the motion and thank James Donnan for bringing the matter to Parliament. I now call on Jamie Hepburn around seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. Can I begin by joining others in uh, thanking uh, James Donnan for bringing forward uh, this debate? Can I thank uh, those other members who have it made a contribution as well. I think uh, the first comment I wanted to pick up on was uh, Mr Finney's uh, remarks. I think he's quite right to uh, make the point that many of us uh, uh, within this parliament are signed up as uh, living wage uh, champions. Uh, I am uh, happy to say I am one such uh, member of, of the Scottish Parliament and I uh, would very much encourage if we aren't already all uh, accredited uh, to be such that uh, others uh, should uh, follow. Can I also uh, pick up on uh, Douglas Ross's uh, contribution uh, just to uh, reflect on the fact I thought his uh, performance today was uh, much better than when I saw him running the line at Farhill Park during uh, the recess in the Partick Thistle uh, Hearts fixture. He called far too many uh, Partick Thistle players offside for my liking, uh, President Officer. And in that regard, I should also like to, uh, not being involved in the same uh, fashion, not at all, in the uh, fixture that Mr Ross will be officiating and utterly uh, disagree with his remarks that that particular fixture will be involving uh, Glasgow's two uh, biggest uh, football clubs. Uh, this is an opportunity uh, to highlight not only uh, the uh, cultural and economic contribution made by uh, Scottish football, but also uh, the distinctive approach to uh, fair work that uh, this Scottish Government has adopted, which of course includes the living wage. The living wage is of critical importance to us as an administration. Of course, through our pay policy, we ensure that everyone who works for us is paid at least the living wage. We provide funding, as I mentioned to Mr Leonard, that we provide funding to the Poverty Alliance to help promote the living wage. And most recently, we've ensured that we're leveraging an additional resource to integration authorities to ensure those working in the social care sector can be paid uh, the living wage. President, President Officer, the labour market strategy we published uh, last month says we want Scotland to be a, a more successful and fairer country with a strong economy and uh, a vibrant, fair and inclusive uh, labour market. A strong focus for this government is on creating more jobs, better quality jobs and jobs that work for everyone in terms of skills, pay, uh, security and prospects because we know that people who feel valued and empowered drive innovation and growth and I'll return to that uh, later but that is why uh, we believe uh, the living wage is uh, so important and that of course is why uh, paying the living wage is uh, one of the core the core requirement of the Scottish business pledge that uh, the Scottish government has established and as well as uh, being a, a living wage accredited employer we should also reflect the fact hearts are a signatory to that uh, Scottish business pledge and indeed Tynecastle uh, stadium was uh, where the First Minister launched uh, that particular pledge. Uh, as Douglas Ross uh, said, football clubs uh, across Scotland play uh, an important role in the communities where they have uh, roots, uh, uh, supporting a range of uh, social uh, and educational uh, programmes. As uh, in my previous role as a health minister, and that being a previous role, it means I don't need to labour the point that Mr Finney should be eating rather less uh, pies when he goes to the, the football. That's not my a concern anymore, but having been the Minister with responsibility... There's uh, no for, need to be quite so personal, Minister. Uh, that, that, would have just been a, that would have been a general message applicable to all members of the Scottish Parliament, I should say, President Officer, not just necessarily Mr Finney alone himself. But thank you for highlighting uh, that. Having been the uh, Minister uh, for Sport uh, previously, uh, I saw much of the, the good work that was uh, done through uh, the football clubs and uh, their 
uh, their arm's length trusts. And in that regard, I should also declare my own interest as a member of uh, the JAGS Trust. And indeed, just uh, recently, I was able to see that in my uh, own area when I met with the uh, Clyde Football Club Community Foundation and also uh, through the work that uh, Cumbernauld Colts Football Club uh, do. Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, in my own uh, specific area of responsibility, we know that uh, many football clubs, Allo Athletic, Wraith Rovers, Celtic and Rangers, uh, the Green Morton Community Trust, uh, Falkirk Football Community uh, Foundation are engaged in uh, the uh, provision of employability support programmes. And indeed, Morton are now in the top two providers for employability programmes in the Inverclyde area, delivering uh, programmes that see, on average, 59% of participants moving into work. So there are, is a lot of uh, good work uh, happening there, but football social uh, responsibility needn't uh, stop uh, there. Uh, as this uh, debate has highlighted, they can uh, play their part in tackling in-work uh, poverty. These, uh, these are clubs that I've referred to that are uh, leaders in their uh, own communities. They can uh, show leadership in terms of pay as well. Hearts are to be applauded for becoming an accredited living wage uh, employer and recognising the many benefits uh, this uh, can bring. There are, in fact, only four uh, football clubs across the entire United Kingdom uh, that are accredited to living wage employers, Hearts uh, being the only Scottish one, Chelsea, uh, Luton Town, and interestingly, uh, FC United of Manchester, which is a semi-professional uh, football team, is an accredited living wage employer. So that clearly shows that there is significant space uh, for growth in the number of football clubs here in Scotland and beyond that could be uh, accredited. And, and there will be other football clubs uh, across Scotland that are uh, paying a living wage. I would urge them uh, to join Hearts in being accredited. Uh, it's clearly positive uh, for them to be visible and recognised. I think they, if they're paying the living wage, they should try and get that recognition. And I won't comment in detail uh, on the exchange between uh, Mr Ross and Mr Dornan uh, regarding Scottish athletics, but I think one clear benefit of accreditation, I think this was the point that Mr Donnan was alluding to, one clear benefit of being accredited is it puts beyond doubt whether or not uh, that particular organisation is in fact paying uh, the living wage. Uh, of course, uh, there is uh, some self-interest for us in administration, enlightened self-interest, President Officer. Uh, more football clubs take part in uh, being accredited. It will assist us with hitting what I do believe is an ambitious target to see an increase in the number of accredited living wage employers to uh, 1,000. Uh, and I'll just uh, say in passing, the reason I think it's ambitious is we started off at a, a starting point of having no accredited living wage employers not so long ago. So I think um, it is a, a reasonable and ambitious target. But of course, if we can go further, we'd be delighted to. And we have made progress in Scotland with the living wage. We now have uh, the uh, second highest proportion of employees uh, paid the, sorry, the highest proportion of employees paid the living wage uh, or, or more across uh, the countries of uh, the United Kingdom. But we do want to go further. I uh, uh, believe that uh, football can play uh, a significant role in that. Uh, we know that paying the living wage is uh, important, not only for those who would be in receipt of such, but I think Ruth McGuire was quite right to make the point that uh, supporting uh, greater equality in our economy and economic growth are not mutually incompatible. Indeed, as our late, recent labour market strategy uh, highlighted, actually they uh, support one another. Uh, more equal societies are more productive societies, and that's why we'll continue to take every effort to promote uh, the living wage in football and beyond. This meeting is suspended until 2.30 p.m. <laughs>